Hello. This is Matthew and it come out. I'm here today to talk to you about the subject of the communion of saints. That's right. It's a very important subject because not a lot of churches really take it seriously. Now, in regard to this subject, I'd just like to say that one of the things that you see today is you see a lot of people claiming that to talk to anybody that has departed from the physical realm of life to be with the Lord Jesus Christ is somebody that you don't want to talk to. That's right. They say you don't want to talk to them at all. In fact, some of these same people speak against the doctrine of blood atonement. The idea that the Lamb of God, Christ Jesus, that through His blood our sins are atoned for, past, present, and future, by the eternal sacrifice that He provides for us from it being brought forth from prior to creation, that's right. This Lamb of God, this eternal sacrifice being brought to us so that we may have our sins atoned for. As you may all know, it is a case that it is Christ himself that says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life left in you. And the fact of the matter is that Jesus also said that uh, his flesh and blood are real food and drink. That's right. Food and drink that a person may eat and never die. Now, having said that, it would be a complete contradiction to say that uh, people that eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood die at all. In fact, reading the scripture as we do, a person cannot make that assumption. In fact, it's even the case that Moses and Elijah, two great men of God who hadn't even been around in the physical sense when Christ was born. You know, they may have been around in the sense of that they had eternal life, but they were not around in the physical sense when Christ was born because they were around prior to that. Well, what the case is, is that Moses and Elijah were seen talking with Christ at the transconfiguration, you know, when his face was glowing, when his face was irradiating with light. And it was at that time, at the transconfiguration, that um, we see very clearly that no one stoned Jesus. Amazing as what that might be for some. It's not amazing to me, but you know, some people might think that, you know, he shouldn't suffer a witch to live. And some people might think that um, stoning Jesus is an appropriate solution to uh, Moses and Elijah visiting him. I don't know. There are some crazy people in this world. Now, quite frankly, I don't think that way. I don't think that, that there should have been any stone. There wasn't any stoning. In fact, nobody even suggested stoning. Just let you think about that for a few minutes. And uh, what this tells us is it tells us there's something different between the time when Moses and Elijah met with Jesus prior to the crucifixion. Scripture is actually said in the Greek New Testament that he was preparing for his departure, or in other words, his exodus. Exodus. The, the term used for departure in the Greek New Testament is basically a form of the word exodus. And so Christ was preparing for his, for his great 
exodus. That means that, you know, he was about to, to depart, just like the Egyptians departed. It's actually said, out of Egypt, I will call my son, referring to Jesus Christ, referring to Israel. That's right. And so, one of the things that we could conclude just from looking at this in a clear observation is that Christ is Israel. Not only is he Israel, but if you're in Christ, you're in the vine. If you're in the vine, you're in the communion of saints. And if you're in the communion of saints, you might be visiting the Lord one day. You might pop in and, hey, guess what? There's Moses and Elijah. You know, it could be like that. You know why it could be like that? It could be like that because the New Testament describes it that way. And, you know, if the New Testament describes it that way, then who are we to question it? So when we look at it very carefully, it really is the case that we should expect these kind of things. In fact, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it's also said in the New Testament that many righteous men also rose from the dead. They rose from the dead to teach the people. So, you know, if you're in ancient Jerusalem, Jesus rises from the dead, and then you see Moses down the street, and then you see Elijah, and you see all these kind of people coming up to you, and they're all telling you the only way for you not to listen is to say, well, you're not Moses, you're not Elijah. It's a sin to talk to the dead. And you know what? That is the most disgraceful abomination that could come out of a man's mouth. The Lord Jesus Christ himself says, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but it's what comes out of his mouth. Because what comes out of his mouth comes from the heart. That's right. In the heart, you've got evil, wicked inclinations. Actually, that's why God destroyed the earth with the flood, because he saw that the hearts of man were evil. There was basically nothing good in them. Every inclination of man's heart was evil. So, from a man's own heart comes many abominations. It's actually said that after the Christ child is born in the book of Revelation, that the serpent, the ancient snake, basically spews out water. You know, the earth opens its mouth and takes in some of that water. And then, you know, the, basically the male heir is carried away to his throne, prepared for some time. Now, when this happens, what's very significant is that this dragon goes after the rest of the lady's offspring. The church, the called out ones, they are not part of the beast system. Now, what is very significant to note is that when those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life see the beast coming out of the abyss, then they will be astonished. That's right, they will be astonished. They will be astonished because, quite frankly, it is the Lamb of God who offers us atonement by blood. He offers that from the creation of the world. Some people don't have that. And when they don't have that, then they may make slanderous accusations against all sorts of people in heaven, against anything holy, trying to destroy those children that come after the blessed King. That's right. Our Lord who reigns on David's throne forever and ever. Amen. Who, who 
rules the entire earth with an iron scepter. That's right. Judging between the nations. I mean, you know, our Lord does that. It said that the virgin lady, the rest of her offspring, will be pursued. They will be pursued. They'll be pursued to be eaten, basically, to be destroyed. And one of the things we see is that when this cataclysmic battle between the beast system, who slander basically everything that's in heaven practically, or as much as they can, you know, anything that's holy, and the elect angels, you know, when this great war in heaven happens, then it's actually said to the birds of the air, meaning the angels, come for the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's right. There's a cry for the angels themselves to feast on the flesh of riders, of men who have fallen, of the great, the mighty, those who have been made low. You know, when you dig a pit for others, it is you yourself who will fall into it. And when this great cataclysmic apocalyptic battle happens and people are destroyed and others feast this great wedding supper of the Lamb, then the scripture that says those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. The scripture that says that becomes fulfilled. Becomes fulfilled because it is Christ who judges those who didn't produce anything with their talents. And he says, you wicked servant. You could have at least put that talent in the bank and drawn some interest. See, instead of these people trying to invest in one another, to love one another, instead, they try to tear each other down. They see somebody, they say, hey, you know, that guy has a mound of education. You know what? He might be poor but than dirt, but you know what? I'm going to tear him down. I'm going to tear him down because I can you know, there may be every word in the Holy Bible against what they're doing. But you know what? In the end, it might look as holy as, as if it was the Pope himself. And, and that's, that's where you get the whole concept of the anti-church. This, this false system. This, this false system that is, is just, it's just a, patch of weeds it doesn't produce a darn thing you know there's there's nothing that comes out of it you ever try to eat a poison berry you know poison berries they might look like fruit but you know what you eat enough and you die and that's that's what we're up against today it's what we're up against today people say you know what they say well, if you saw Jesus, then you know what? It might have been an angel of light and a demon. And if you saw the Holy Mother Mary, well, they won't even call her the Holy Mother Mary. They'll say, if you saw Mary at all. They'll say, if you saw the Apostle John, Peter, or who knows who. You know, for them, it's like, it's like, it's like Saul, Saul going to this witch and this witch bringing this person up from the dead. You know, if that is to be the entire interpretation of the communion of saints, then when Jesus Christ was speaking on earth with Moses and Elijah, you would think that the whole band of Jews would have put him to death. You would think that some people would say, hey, you know what? This guy is a false messiah. You know why? 
they would say, because Saul, Saul, he was anointed as a Mashiach. And you know what the term Christ actually means, in the Christus in Greek? It actually is a combination of two words. One, Mashiach, meaning anointed, and the other, Son of God. And so, people would say, he's making a claim that he's anointed of God, just like Saul. They could say, you know what? I think we might have to get some stones out. In fact, you know, when Peter himself ate at the home, at the very home of some people that were considered outcasts because they did not have a strict adherence to the law of Moses, you know, because of a dream he ate there. He didn't really question and say, is this dream from God or not? Because he knew that God controls everything. Not only did he know that God controls everything, he knew that the Lord Jesus Christ says, upon this rock I will build my church. So, when Peter has a dream and he goes and he you know, tabernacles, so to speak, among these, these, these outcasts, then that's his very own brother and that want to stone him afterward. And all he has to say is, you know what, I had a dream. Okay, well, it's against the ancient Jewish law to eat pork. Scripture says, what God has made clean, let no man call unclean. It's also against the ancient Jewish law for witches to be around. You know, suffer a witch not to live. Okay, well, when the Lord Jesus Christ is with Moses and Elijah, it's just like the case in eating a pork. People don't say a darn thing about it. And you know why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ, He is the Lord God Jesus Christ. So nobody had to say anything, really. And that's the point. That's the whole entire point. If you get anything out of this, you know, the point is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's going to judge the living and dead. And you know, unless you have the, His Lordship over your life, then you could be making some of these same mistakes that the ancient people would have made if they could have. You know, Jesus does a great miracle. People say that it is by the spirit of Beelzebub that He drives out demons. I mean, this is insane! And he comes right out, says that the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is the unforgivable sin. I mean, think about that. Now, if Christ does a miracle through the Father's Word, and if we're to do those same miracles, because the scripture says that you will do even greater things than I because I am going to my Father. And I believe he was talking to the apostles. Now, if it says that, then it means that we can expect to have times in our lives where we see Moses, we see Elijah, where we even raise the dead. Peter rose the dead. We could expect times in our lives where, where there's miraculous healing. We should. If Jesus said it, you know, he'd have to be a liar for it to be false. And you know what? Philip, Philip would have believed that. And I'm sure he does, and I'm sure he did. And you know why? Because it's in the book of Acts itself. Philip is going down the road, and 
guess what? There's a eunuch, you know, a, a head of a, a treasury from another country that came in for a Jewish feast and he's going home. I mean, what an occurrence. And, he, and that guy that had this high position, even though he was a eunuch, he was, he was willing to talk to somebody that didn't even have a ride. A guy, a common looking guy. It was Philip the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was a common looking guy. You know, it was kind of like entertaining angels unaware. You know, the term angelos in Greek means messenger. And that's exactly what Philip was, is he was a messenger. He was human, but he was a messenger. He was a messenger because, you know what? You know, here's the eunuch trotting along, and here's Philip coming up to him. Philip's like, you understand what that scroll means? It was a scroll of Isaiah, you know, Philip, and the... The eunuch didn't know, so Philip helped him out. Helped him out. That meant that the scroll actually meant something about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know why it meant something about the Lord Jesus Christ? And the reason why is because Philip, after explaining what the scroll meant, baptized the eunuch, a head of state. That's right, and he, the guy went along rejoicing. And then Philip, I mean, it's like he was just kind of snap and taken away somewhere else spirit of the Lord just kind of you know whooshed him away and he reappeared somewhere else Philip was was human but yet he could be taken from one place to another now all this to be said it is very important to recognize that there's a demonic sort of thing that happens and there's a non-demonic kind of thing that happens when people deal with with non-human things just put it that way or people or whatever you know angels saints you know there there could be a lot of good and evil but it's just like it's just like me walking to the store i don't know if the guy in the cash register is evil I mean, I don't know unless I use some discernment of the Spirit. Try to discern His Spirit. Try to see if He's evil or not. Some people don't have the discernment of the Spirit. They don't have that spiritual gift. And so, you know, if they feel like they're lacking something, you know, they might think, well, oh, the Scripture says the Holy Ghost will lead us into all truth. Well, I don't have all truth now. So if somebody appears to have more truth, they may say, I'm just going to slander that guy that has more truth. You know, somebody that has the ability to discern, to discern a spirit and say, this is good and this is evil. You know, somebody else that doesn't have that gift may come along and say, hey, you know what? What you're doing is evil. They may say, all we need is the word of God. We just need to memorize it and just take it as face value and then once we take it as face value we just need to cut out the parts that say anything about anything spiritual and then slander the guy's church down the street and feel proud about it feel feel uplifted feel like oh god i'm such a good christian because everybody else looks up to me because I could say something about the guy's church down the street. Those fools. And you know what? That's wrong. That's wrong to feel that way. It's wrong to think that way. It's wrong to associate with those kind of people. Unless you have to. You know, quite frankly, there's, there's plenty of room in hell that I'm sure is free. You know, we don't have to worry about these issues. It's actually the case that the truth needs no justification. Needs no justification because regardless of whether you believe in the truth or not, it's still the truth. And the truth is the truth today, it's the truth tomorrow, and it's the truth forever. And so, I'll let you think about that. 
that's actually the case just to give you a final remark that it would be better according to the scripture for somebody to unload themselves in their pants that's right either by defecating themselves or wetting their pants in church it'd be better for that to happen than for somebody to stand up and to slander somebody and the reason why is because it's out of the mouth that a person is defiled from the mouth comes all sorts of defilement because it comes from the heart whereas what goes into a person's mouth is clean because it goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and out the body there's no indication that that process is a defiling process but there's every indication that what comes out of the mouth can be very defiling very defiling and very contrary to the Word of God and so I'll let you think about that and I'll let you think about another important topic too while I'm here this is a case set in Proverbs chapter 8 chapter 9 chapter 8 says you know I wisdom dwell together with prudence I was there before the Lord created heavens and the earth assisting at his side rejoicing always mankind and chapter 9 then goes on to start out wisdom has built her house she has hewn out her seven pillars she has mixed her wine meat prepared her table it's the Lord's Supper right there maybe allusion to Passover specifically you know she calls out to those who are simple come here eat with me and that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing he's calling out it's actually the Holy Ghost that calls people out into from the world into the Lord's Supper calling to people though they're simple saying come and eat with me come and eat with me and when we come and we eat then that means that we gain understanding that's why it's wisdom that presides over this in fact that is a allusion to the Lord Jesus Christ it's not only Lord but also teacher who through the sacraments imparts understanding not only understanding but many other things as well righteousness in fact these are very important concepts to consider and without them we're just kinda lost it's actually said that the anointing from the laying on a hand that it is that that teaches us and so I thank you very much for watching God be praised